All right, so this is John Reed, and I'm rejoined by Brian Summer. We are on the clock here at Cloud World 2023. We are winding down. This is the last of the full two days of the media analyst extravaganza. Planes, trains, and automobiles await us tomorrow, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see who I'm sitting beside on my next Southwest flight. Uh, yeah, this yeah. will be like my fourth one this week. Yeah, well, I got to talk to an Epicor consultant on the way out. It was super exciting. <laughs> uh, so, so, look, we're not going to do a long uh, debrief of the Oracle conference here because, frankly, we're both on the clock. We don't have a lot of time, and we're also just – going to give listeners a more concise review of what we've learned. But it has been a whirlwind couple of days. Um, Brian, I know you've got a bunch of notes for us, so take it away. What have you learned, man? Well, obviously, all the big headlines coming out here, one way or another, involve either industries or artificial intelligence. And there have been some other announcements around like databases. They actually made a lot of functional improvements, a lot in in HR alone. Uh, So... It's all, it's all been a solid chunk of news. It would be hard to digest the whole show and all the announcements in just a few minutes. One thing I do think that most people don't realize is when you see all the vertical solutions that Oracle has, and they got a pile of them, and they started off on a morning keynote, uh, I guess that was Tuesday or whatever, kind of listing some of them. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is where did all this knowledge that Oracle has about all these verticals come from? So I just jotted down from memory what I know. And here are just some of them. They know a lot about project management, a little bit about construction and the architectural engineering construction industry from an acquisition they made of Primavera. They know a bunch about process manufacturing from a company, I think it was Data Logics that they bought. Uh, from J.D. Edwards, they picked up all kinds of discrete manufacturing, construction, mining, and other vertical knowledge. Uh, in retail, Micros was an acquisition they made, and they got a whole bunch of knowledge about POA, point of sale and other commercial stuff. Siebel gave them CRM. Taleo gave them telling the acquisition. PeopleSoft gave them HRMS and a whole bunch more. I guess what I'm getting at is when you net it all out, what they, what they got out of those deals were huge amounts of process knowledge, data models, and all that kind of stuff, which for a regular kind of startup would have to painfully spend years trying to collect this stuff. So with everything they pick up on it, they've been able to basically transfer that knowledge, data model, everything else out of an old architecture, build it fresh and under their fusion architecture. And that's why they can field such a huge amount of vertical solutions today. They're even, they talked many times in keynotes here about Cerner's healthcare product being rewritten with Apex and everything else to be a native Oracle application uh, product line. So it's not surprising that's how they got where they are. What is interesting though is if you want to compete with Oracle as an apps vendor, oh man, you've got some work to do. John? Well, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think the, you know, I talked with Steve Miranda before the conference, and one of the things I really liked about our discussion, which translated pretty well, I thought, to his keynote today, was, you know, I think he and I sh- share a little bit of a stump speech around this notion of the importance of of two things when it comes to so-called cloud ERP, if you want to call it that. One is... Uh, the importance of extracting value after go live that that go live's really just the beginning and it's 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 an important point because PR firms are always pressing this issue around like oh we signed this customer we signed this customer it's like okay you went live fine um, but the real benefits start to come later when you start thinking about how are we using these systems to serve our customers better to clean up our general ledger to like basically roll out new business lines mm-hmm. to handle mergers and acquisitions do we have a more flexible and adaptable system or do we not and you have to work for it and what what we have was we had more mature customers that have been running at scale on these on on the fusion and cloud apps for quite a while and then you also see this industry angle which really changes things because now we can really have industry conversations about this platform and not just generalized conversations. And so what Oracle has done is they've created these general concepts like the financial supply chain, and then they've adapted them to these verticals. And you heard that on the keynote stage today. 
from Providence Health. And I, I talked with Providence Health in more detail later, and it was basically like, yeah, like they didn't have it all right away. But to your point, they, they said they were going to do it. They put about eight or nine things in the roadmap, and they got it done. And so now you can have a much more interesting conversation because when you're talking with Miranda about including improving that financial supply chain for healthcare, he's got very specific examples of, of the workflows that hospitals are dealing with, what the pain points are. And I think that's a really interesting conversation. And I give Oracle some credit for making sure that conversation happened here rather than just having a generative AI conversation. Because while Oracle is shipping a bunch of generative AI functionality across products in the next few releases, the fact of the matter is that customers have crap they got to deal with right now. And generative, generative AI, as interesting as it can be in some cases, it just isn't ready yet. It will be soon, but it's just not there. Well, you brought it up on the generative AI, so let's let's talk about it because that that was in every presentation here at the show, pretty much. Would you agree? It was a constant theme. Yeah, um, and uh, it's it's. You know, we hear that same kind of, um, we hear variants of that basically at pretty much every event um, starting about mm, March or April of this year, I guess. What, what's become very clear in these shows is vendor after vendor is starting to draw a bright line as to what parts of uh, their AI strategy are going to be in public tools versus private tools or private, uh, you know, large language models, whatever. And where is the customer's data and how is it going to be protected? Uh, we got airfuls of that at this particular show. And rightfully so. Uh, I think lots of customers, prospects, even partners maybe at this show um, still don't have maybe all the answers they want, but more importantly, I think a lot of them don't even know what the questions are they should be asking and where they need to, you know, uh, dig and go further on this. Uh, I do like, you know, a lot of Oracle strategy seems to be, we're going to take an existing application and we're not going to try and do something really wild and radical. They're extending it a, a bit, you know, the regular application they're bringing, like analytics is getting a supercharged uh, dose of, AI and some of the modules, and that's a good use for it. And um, I think, you know, uh, it sounds like they're prepping us to let us know that come this time next year, they're going to probably have a hundred other announcements or some other stuff, hopefully driven more by customers and less so maybe by their internal uh, product management function. Yeah, and I think Miranda did say that about 80% of the things they're working on now for that generative AI are coming from customer requests and customer uh, ideas because he's saying that once customers are kind of getting a flavor for what's available mm. and what it can do, they're starting to say, hey, why can't it do this and this? And I heard that in a couple of my customer interviews like this this week was like, I, we asked Oracle if, if they would make it do this. Because mm -hmm. once you start playing with it in your environment, the light bulb starts to go off a little bit in terms of, hey, it would be enormously helpful. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that that we're dealing with is – I don't know that I felt that Oracle's messaging around this was all that differentiated in some ways, but in other ways it was. And I'll explain what I mean. Like, so Oracle gave their own take on what you would call responsible AI. And I get, do get a little frustrated with enterprise vendors because I don't think they realize that basically they're all saying mostly the same stuff. And it's good stuff. It's like, here's how we're going to protect customer data privacy, but still you know, help you to train the model if you want to on your own data. Oracle had answers for that. Uh, explainability, we didn't get into that too much, but I'm sure if you ask them, they have good answers for that. So all these um, vendors, I think, are doing the right kind of thinking as far as, like, we're going to make sure your IP doesn't become part of someone else's, <laughs> you know, screenplay, mm -hmm. you know, like chat GPT style. So they're answering those questions, and, and that's good. We're getting more specifics. But I don't think it's all that differentiated in terms of messaging. On the other hand, when I spent an hour a few months ago kicking tires on Oracle's HCM plans for generative AI, I quite liked what I heard because I kept trying to poke holes in it because they were like, oh, it's going to do this and that. It's going to do performance reviews. And I was like, hold on a sec. I see a lot of problems with machines writing performance reviews for humans. Mm -hmm. and, but in the dialogue with them, it showed me they had really thought through that. And so I guess what I would encourage listeners to do is 
if you have an interest in what a, a vendor, if you're a customer of Oracle, any enterprise vendor, get that one-on-one -on -one time to go through that stuff and push the questions because that's where it gets interesting, not on the keynote stage. I don't think that's very interesting, but it is interesting to spend an hour talking through like, here's how we're going to do this in such a way that makes HR people's lives better, but doesn't compromise you know, bias. Because I get really concerned when I think about, wait, the AI is going to serve up a short list of candidates? Like, well... You know, you're putting a lot of trust in the system then to surface candidates in a fair manner. And these are great discussions to have. You know? Well, anyone who knows me knows I have a certain writing voice or whatever. Yeah. And if they got a performance review from me and it wasn't in that voice, it was in some yeah. glommed up AI voice. Uh, yeah. They know it. Not only would they know what I didn't write it, they would also know that it it comes off as insincere that I didn't. I didn't value somebody's work enough to even bother to take time to write a five-sentence uh, summary paragraph of your contribution this year or whatever for our our company. So, yeah, or, I, 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 I'm, I'm tracking with you on all this, yeah. We're where I do good. think Oracle is differentiated, and I think where it will be even more differentiated, there was also in the more technical keynotes discussions around where Oracle has progressed with NVIDIA and GPUs and the whole AI supercomputer yeah. thing. Now, that's something that other vendors in the space touch. don't have. Right. And, you know, so for example, if you do a search on this, uh, one of the things from earlier this year, Oracle ties up NVIDIA to offer AI supercomputing service. What I can tell you is Larry will talk with you about that for as long as you want to talk about it. And, and I would just recommend if Larry thinks it's important, Maybe it's worth having a hard look at why he does, mm -hmm. and and if it once they start connecting the dots between that infrastructure and their application strategy, then I think they have a different value prop than other vendors. Well, you're actually really hitting a, a big hot button here. Um, the all the stories we keep hearing from um, other software vendors when they talk about like. We have a new like ERP stack or platform or whatever, and they're talking about we got to upgrade the platform. They really don't talk much about the stuff at the bottom end of the platform. And at this show in particular, boy, you get a whole education about everything: uh, containers and uh, different kinds of processors, clusters, uh, whether you can run Oracle Cloud infrastructure inside an Azure data center, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you get, you get the master's degree conversation here, whereas you get a playground kind of discussion at some of the other vendors. And the important, it's not just the conversation, it's the simple fact that these guys are running on what? their own hardware, Sun hardware, they're running it with uh, at a scale to just uh, make your head spin. And they've been tuning and tuning and tuning uh, their apps and apps performance from the moment somebody swipes right on their cell phone until it hits some end server and it's done all these computations and bounced around from there. Uh, and I know other vendors are going to you know, chafe when I say this because they're going to tell me, oh, but we tuned our stuff. And you probably did. Don't get me wrong. And it probably works in a very acceptable fashion. But it's different when you deal with a vendor who owns the entirety of this stuff. And repeatedly, I heard uh, execs here talk about uh, customers, uh, Oracle's customers don't worry about anything below almost the app layer, and that's it. Because everything else is the same everywhere. They have it around the world, and it all works the same way with the same level of performance and security. So I want to just, uh, as we head towards a close, I want to tie a couple of themes together and then see what you think. Uh, in my customer interviews, and I did several, I've published one of them already, we talked I talked about this post go, go live thing with them and how how you measure success in a post go live context. What are because what I'm really interested in is is not the vendors metrics around customer success. I'm interested in the customers metrics, mm -hmm. how they define success, and I'm particularly interested in how they are serving their customers better because I feel like ERP can no longer be internally focused. You have to be able to judge it by how you're performing in the market, how you're serving your stakeholders. And customers I use loosely because it could be suppliers. In some cases, you could define employee groups as customers also. 
And it was really interesting to hear customers share some of their metrics. And they were different for different customers. But one of the common themes was that we don't want to just look at it like we're absorbing new features and functions. We want to look at it around like, do we have better uh, retention rates? Are our employees happier? Are, you know, and, and one of the interesting things talking to Providence Health about is, are you being more strategic because healthcare workers are bogged down in administrivia? And the reason I mention this is because for all generative AI sex appeal, if it's done right in an enterprise context, the same thinking will apply, which is what, are, what kind of return am I going to get on this? Like, how is it actually going to help me? Because this is not going to be cheap. The pricing is, is going to vary, and, and a lot of that is maybe consumption-based, but it's not going to be cheap to use these generative AI services. So you're going to have to apply the same benchmarks, metrics, maturity models, all that stuff. This is not some transcendent technology. It's subject to the same shit that everything else is. So let's see. Let's see if it can pass muster. You know. Well, I'll put a different nuance on that. I, I don't disagree. I would tell you that we're in a different age of the software industry now. Uh, I would think by now we've figured out how to do a double entry accounting record that we yeah. know how to pay a bill and all these other things. Uh, a lot of the focus on a lot of shows is we hear someone's got you know a slightly better mouse trap on like um, you know customer remittances or whatever. Okay, well that's um, I think we've solved a lot of those kind of problems, and we need to we we and customers I think they're anxious to hear vendors approach them with. Um, Solutions that have never been solved before or analytics they've never seen before or insights yep. about their business. You know, we're no longer really in the software and productivity gain business as much as we're in the right. uh, in the value creation for business in whatever way that takes place. Right. And I think we need to, you know, the whole industry probably needs a, a recalibration on what is the conversation we want to have with customers as well as with prospects. I think it's overdue. Yeah, because on the one hand, generative AI readiness is about a risk assessment of IP exposure and all this other stuff, customer data. But on the other hand, I think it provokes a very interesting conversation along the lines of what you're describing, which is, can can this be one of the tools that helps me to fundamentally change how I do business? And that's where it gets interesting. And And for example, I thought in Ellison's keynote, one of the most powerful things I heard this year was him basically saying, like, no more Java. Like... <laughs> These guys know a little thing or two about that. And, yeah, I thought. And, and 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 look, I mean, Ellison's known for, shall we say, grandiose statements at times. But it's just interesting when you hear someone say something like that. And then he provided some very specific examples of how their development process is being dramatically enhanced by these new generative approaches. I think that's interesting. Well, you know? it's funny you bring that up because I'm going to be going to a um, process automation uh deal in a couple of weeks. And I know they're going to want to bend my ear and talk all about JSON and Java and no code, low code, and everything yep. else. And what's interesting here is we're, we're already, the conversation's moving past that. In fact, I think a lot of people are a little surprised at just how short the effective lifespan of some of these technologies have gotten. Uh, you know, I think back way back in the day, I learned five programming languages that still kind of sort of exist in a way like COBOL and PL1 and RPG, but they're not, they're so far from mainstream right now. But even the fact that we're talking almost uh, nostalgically about like JSON and Java is kind of, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I guarantee you, we're going to look at like all this no code, low code stuff, which really is code, in my opinion. Uh, and we're going to go, no, that's not no, you know, there's even something way more powerful than that. And one of those things is just have your a, your chat GPT or whatever kind of tool trained on a programming language or your software and let it generate the code for you. So why are we even talking about a language when we have an AI tool that can generate whatever we need? Well, and, and to your point, like... These are the refreshing stories when you hear them from customers. Like, so uh, the first um, day of the conference, I interviewed uh, True Blue. They do a lot of 
uh, workforce support automation stuff for their clients. And he, the a CEO told me they had an employee over the weekend. He decided he gave us he gave the guy a system development license, and over the weekend he wrote his own bot, and it addressed garnishments. They do sixty. 60,000 garnishments a year, I guess. And he wrote a bot to automate all of that over a weekend. Now, he wasn't using Oracle, actually. Sorry, Oracle. Uh, he was using UiPath and Alteryx in this case. Okay. But the point is, like, those are cool stories because, you know, you're talking about unleashing the talent in your organization, to your point. It's not, we're not just talking about efficiencies here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that kind of stuff is, frankly, exciting. It's, it's fun to talk about. Yeah, um, maybe we're moving out of the age of software and we're moving into the age of surprises yeah. and hopefully pleasant ones more than unpleasant ones. But um, we're going to look back in the very near future. We're going to look back and go like, man, that was, you know, that was like primitive stuff back then. You compare, a, compare an early automobile to what's on the street today that's EV powered and everything else. And you're just like blown away with what's in them. And that's kind of, I think, where we're at right now. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a confluence of a whole bunch of innovations all hitting at once that are fundamentally changing the software industry. And I feel for the executives to try to simplify that story and tell it to a large crowd of, you know, in the thousands like at this show. But that's what's really going on. Yeah, and, 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 and it's also the age of, less proprietary stuff. Like I mentioned this True Blue example, UiPath and Alteryx, but on an Oracle platform. And then you have Oracle and Microsoft, unlikely frenemies doing, you know, infrastructure things together and talking about how there is no mono, you know, single Monolithic, cloud. yeah. And, and, you know, look, I mean, this stuff is not just handshakes and smiles, let's face it. I mean, a lot, <laughs> let, the vendors will still stab each other in the back when they need to. <laughs> like, let's be honest with each other. But the point is like, like, that, that's a good point, I think, for customers where, you know, like like Providence Health, for example, is is, is not a Cerner customer. They're an Epic customer. And so I had a really interesting talk with them about that. And, like, you know, who would have thought, like, years ago that you would be able to have those conversations? It's, 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 it, it's not perfect. Well, it's not perfect, but it's better. I, I'm not ready to fully concede that some partnerships have great longevity, and here's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jeffrey Moore, uh, the guy who wrote Crossing the Chasm, a ton of other books, uh, Jeff and I were having a sit-down. Um, we've met many times. We were talking at some show, and and I asked him about partner these kind of partnerships yeah, between yeah, yeah. two big firms, and he had the most delicious way of describing it. He said that... Um, an alliance of two giant technical companies is yeah. like a dance of two bears. If you can actually get the two of them in the same room, stand up and interlock arms, that may only last about a, yeah. a few seconds before one of them takes a swipe at the other, and then you got a bloody mess on your hands. Yeah. He goes, the best partnering models are when you have like the school teacher and the little elementary students following right behind her or him. And uh, I've never forgotten that conversation because I have seen that model work a lot of times. Yeah, but yeah. to your point, though, it was rather interesting. I don't know if Larry Ellison's mellowed a bit over the years, but Sacha is a very calm kind of guy. Yeah. So you don't have this like Balmer, um, Ellison yeah. kind of deal that may come with built-in friction right off the bat. That may have been yeah. the dance. The, the old cage. The old cage match. Yeah. We're here watching the I don't like some <laughs> coming this Sunday to the Houston Sam Houston Coliseum <laughs> in the Battle Royale death uh, death match loser leaves town for life kind of thing. Now that was the way it was, and I think all these folks have awakened to the idea that the customer is going to dictate the terms of what kind of relationships yeah. they want vendors to have, and that I think is part of the new kind of awakening and partnerships. Just to realize you may have to partner with your enemy because that's what your customer wants. <laughs>